Hey, well, good morning, everybody. How do you like, uh, how do you like your new church? Uh, isn't that exciting? It's great to have, it's great to be here. This morning we experienced another first, our first breakfast here. So thanks to all of you who brought some goodies for us. You know, we've been hearing some amazing stories of how people came last weekend and were touched in all kinds of ways. If you have a story about a friend or a family member that you brought, please let us know. Please share it with us because it really does bless us. Come on in as close as you can, okay? Come on in as close as you can. There's, a, there's plenty of seats over here. For example, we heard about um, the, the husband of somebody, a lady who comes to our church. In fact, she's here this morning. She, her husband does not, is not a churchgoer, and she invited him, and family invited him to come, and he says, I only go to church once a year. And he said, oh, please come. So he came, and he, I heard that at dinner, he couldn't stop talking about the church. So, so the wife told me, so pray for him. You don't need to know his name, but just pray for him that he'll come back this weekend. Don't forget the best assimilation strategy we have is that if you brought a friend, you ask them to come back. And, and I can't think of a better weekend uh, that they can come back at. Hey, a couple of announcements real quick. One is somebody has a, a silver Honda, I believe, parked in the back. It's in a handicap uh, space, but apparently something, there's some kind of a rupture underneath the car and all this water's coming up so if that's your car would you go back there and move it and that's I don't think it's the car that's having a rupture I think it's something underneath and we are having a bunch of glitches here in the new place we're still trying to figure that out we don't have we still have only a temporary certificate of occupancy it's supposed to have a final inspection on Tuesday pray that we pass that and once we pass that then we can start doing a whole bunch of other things including putting a sink in the kitchen and all those things. So please uh, take care of all that for us, and, 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 and please pray for all that. And then also, um, let's see, Saturday night service. We, we are expecting, we didn't expect so many people to show up for the grand opening because it was so last minute, but we had 10 people short of 1,400 last weekend. And I think that there's a good chance that a whole bunch of them are going to come back. So I'm ch trying to get as many of you, many folks, to move over to the Saturday night service as you can. But if, you all, if all our leaders come on Saturday night and then no one shows up on Sunday, then we're going we're to be hurting. So you can come on Saturday night, enjoy the service, and then come on Sunday to serve. And it's going to be a great service. And let everyone know that Pastor, Pastor uh, Wayne is going to be here tonight. Uh, last week was, was definitely a game changer for our church. You know, we've had large groups come to our church, like for Easter, and then the week after that, we're back to our normal t attendance. Last week was a game changer because this week, this weekend, we're going to have another big crowd, I believe. And so, and hopefully, uh, don't tell anyone, don't tell them that I'm speaking next weekend because then no one will, <laughs> no one will really want to come, but we're, we're hoping, we're thinking that this is a game changer and that people are going to continue to come and come and come, and so... That's why you are so important, because we can't move into the future without leaders. And when Pastor Greg and I were at the, the leadership practicum at New Hope uh, a few months ago, we were invited to go to the School of Church Leadership that Pastor Wayne started there at New Hope, Oahu, at 6 o'clock in the morning on Friday and we were tired and blurry-eyed, but we looked at each other afterwards. We were so inspired, and we said to each other, we got to get one of these going at South Bay. And so that's why we started this. It was really an inspiration that we got from Pastor Wayne that we need to build the next generation and, and reach the next generation. The only way we're going to do it is by developing leaders. And so that's why you're a part of this, and that's why this is so exciting. Now, so when Pastor Wayne said he was going to be here this weekend, I would, last night I had dinner with him, and I was asking him, so what's going on in your life? And he was telling me, well, I'm doing this, and I've got the school, and I've got the faculty to deal with. I got tired just listening to him <laughs> telling me about all those things. <clears throat> and yet here he is at South Bay Community Church teaching us about leadership, the School of Church Leadership. And so I don't know about you, but I'm just so blessed and so thankful that of all the things that he could be doing, he is here, and he's going to teach us. So um, I just praise God for him. Would you just give him a warm South Bay welcome as he comes to uh, teach us this morning? Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, everybody. Ohayou gozaimasu. Ni hao ma. Annyeonghaseyo. Bokeer tov, mashalom kem. 
Okay, that's Hebrew. All right, so <laughs> we stop at Hebrew. Okay, all right. Well, it's good to see you. My, when uh, we knew that we were going to come up here, we were pitching the hot potato back and forth, uh, trying to determine if you're going to be in the new place or not, because it was yes, and then no, and then yes. So it is yes. It is yes. We're happy for that. Well, I'm glad that we get to partner together in these years ahead as an affiliate church with New Hope International, and uh, it's just neat because our sound people can talk back and forth, our music people, hip-hop, whether it's dance or whether it's outreach, and scores, MP3 files can go back and forth, so it'll really, really be a wonderful season ahead of learning, of trying, experimenting, but here's one of the things I want to encourage each of you to continue to do to remember this as a leader your main role is to be a delivery system of God's love to people. Bottom line, that's it. Because you see, people are coming here not just to hear a speaker or music, they're here to see if God really loves them. Does God know about me? Does God care about my problem at home, my financial setback, my, my future? I don't know where I'm going in my future. I just lost my job or... <clears throat> My child's in the hospital. Does he care? Is there anything in it for me? Will God help at all? And so they're going to come here. For a lot of people, it's the last resort. They will have come here because they've tried doctors. They've tried charlatans. They've tried cults. They've tried meditation. They've tried alcohol. They've tried drugs. And then they say, I wonder if God can help. So it's sort of like their last train stop. And I don't know if we'll ever find out the full statistics on this, but a lot of times people will try God, and if to them God does not work, suicide is next. And so a lot of people will come here that close to cashing it all in. You will never know it. But if you're a radiance of God's love, then they will see God and they won't see you. That's why everyone needs to be servants. You see, in the, the Bible says in Luke, it says, uh, who is greater the one at the head table or the one at the footstool? Well, in the world, it's the people at the head table. But I am among you as one who serves. In other words, if you want to go to a place looking for me, don't look at the head table. Don't look under the spotlights. You want to find me? I'll be among whom? The servants. People out there loving on people, caring for people, people with a wash bowl in one hand and a towel over the other. That's where you'll find me. Now watch this. If not too many people want to serve, and when, you, when you're called a leader, it means that you are leading in the serving of others. You're a servant leader. So if you can remember that. When we say leader, it doesn't mean you're separated from the people and you're up above. A, a leader in Christ's mind is that you're a servant leader. You're leading the serving. Because Christ is called the servant of God, the servant of mankind. He's the one who led in serving mankind with redemption, righteousness, etc. So he leads the way, but as a servant. So he says, by the way, if you want to find me, look among the servants. servants. Now watch this. If very few people are serving, then when people come here to South Bay, they're, they're hard-pressed to see Jesus. They'll see programs. Lights, sound, facilities, but any of them gonna, any of that that I just mentioned gonna save them? How about forgive their sins? How about give them hope? Zero. That's just a framework. You and Jesus, that's the picture. And then you are beckoning those into the heart of Christ, not into the framework of the church. Now we're gonna get the frame better and better, but if you put 80% of your attention on the frame, 20% on the picture, you missed the picture. So you are incredibly important because you are the servant leaders and you've come today to say, I'm willing, I'm going to jump in. That's why you are critical to the plan of God. So sometimes I'll say, how many ushers do we have? And about 10 people will raise their hand. I'll say, let's all raise our hands. In fact, let's do this. Let's, how many ushers do we have? Everybody raise your hand. Good. Yeah, you are now ushers. Okay. Okay. Because everybody can usher, right? Yeah, see? It's not hard. You don't have to have a nameplate that says usher. Just usher people. You can open the door. You can help them, you know, mom with a carriage. You can 
help people get seated. You know, greeters. How many greeters do we have? Everybody raise your right hand. Everybody, everybody. Some of you raising your other right hand, your left hand. Okay, all right. So this is not an anatomy test, but that's all right. Yeah, okay. Raise your hand. So we can all be greeters. Isn't that right? Every single one of us. How many cleanup people do we have? Raise your hand. Yeah, we can all clean up. All clean up. I was talking about this one day to a guy named David. We were talking about everyone should serve, not just a few who are assigned to it. Everybody, because we want our leadership to grow that are servant leaders. And a lot of times, everybody wants to be called a servant, but nobody wants to be treated like one. Well, you, you graduate to servanthood here at South Bay. You don't start at servanthood and move away from it as fast as you can. You have to graduate. And so we're talking about the fact that the true test of a servant is how you respond when people treat you like one. Because you have to be great in order to be a servant. Didn't Jesus say, let the one who is greatest be servant of all? Great how? Well, great in patience, great in character, great in love, great in endurance, great in perseverance. You have to be great in forgiveness. You have to be great to be a servant. Otherwise, you'll call, be called a servant, but you're just like. We all like that word, you know, I'm a servant of God, but don't treat me like one. No, the truest test of a servant is how you respond when you're treated like one. Number one. The second test of a servant is do you initiate or do you wait to be told? A servant always initiates. He sees a piece of paper, he picks it up. He doesn't say, you need to have an usher pick that up. Or, hey, brother, could you pick that up? Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. You don't wait for that. A, a leader goes what? If you're a leader, you're in front or in back? Usually in front, right? So a servant leader goes before others. They see a thing that needs to be cleaned, they clean it. They see a paper that needs to be picked up, they pick it up. They see a young man or young woman acting silly, they go over there and counsel. They just take the courage to lead but you're leading in serving. And so you are going to be treated. How do, you re how do you respond? The second is, do you initiate? And as we finish, this guy named David, who was a teacher at a local school, um, said, I got to run. We got a big teacher's faculty meeting. So I said, okay, Dave, go, run, run. So he, he took off, and then he tells me the story later. He said, I got to the auditorium. All the faculty was in the auditorium. I was the last guy coming in. He said, oh, man, I'm late, so I better hurry. So he's going through the door, and there was some, a McDonald's a bag there on the side and a cup. So he thought, oh, I just learned about serving. I should go throw that away. And a, and a leader goes first. He doesn't ignore. He, he initiates. So he said, oh, I got to do that. So he grabbed it, and, and he went to throw it away when the vice principal said, hey, that's mine. He said, oh, sorry, I just thought it was rubbish. He said, it is. He said, well, I was just going to throw it away for you. He said, no, no, it's mine. And he said, I was just going to throw it away. He said, I know. Give it to me. <laughs> David said, okay, here. He gave him the rubbish, and he walks up front, goes to the microphone, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about serving our students. And I planted rubbish outside of the door to see which one of you 800 teachers would pick it up. None of you picked it up except David. David, stand up. We have a prize for you. It's a weekend away flight and hotel to a neighboring island. Everyone clap. <laughs> when he told me that, I said, you owe me, dude. You owe me. <laughs> At least breakfast. But you see, a leader initiates, doesn't he? A leader initiates. Sometimes we don't want to be a reflection of God's love because, you know, it's like, a, uh, I don't know, I might do something wrong. I might say something that people don't like. Listen, it's in 1 John chapter 4, and it says this, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you have fear in love, you're going to be afraid of, oh, maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. Oh, maybe someone won't like what I say. Or I might not just do it just right. So I better just kind of put my hands in my pocket and wait. But see, 
Perfect love casts out all fear. And this is the body, not bodies, the body of Christ. So you're going to make a few mistakes in this new situation, the new facility. But if your heart is good, listen carefully. The worst thing an honest person can do is make an honest mistake. I didn't say not make mistakes. See, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but rises again. So the righteous man falls seven times. It doesn't say that the righteous man never falls. The righteous man falls seven times and rectifies it, learns from it, reconciles it, and is wiser still. So righteousness is not in never falling. Righteousness is in making a mistake, confessing it, and becoming better because of it. And God says, that's righteousness. And a lot of times there's a bunch of people in a church that are never going to be called righteous because they're afraid to do anything wrong. They never make a mistake. But perfect love casts out all fear. Now, you're uh, a radiance of God's love to the people that are coming in. So you cannot have fear to say, hi, my name is, how are you? Do you have children? Can I help? Can I walk into the children's uh, department? Here, come on in, sit with me. All of those things will make a world of difference, let me tell you. Now, why are we afraid? Well, because, you know, if you look at a party, watch a party of some kind, everybody comes in and, uh, you know, you're looking around and you're always wondering about, how do I look? How are my earrings? Does my purse match my shoes? Does anyone have the same dress I have on? You know, right? So we're just like, oh, we're just afraid. So we're just kind of, and you're just pensive and very reticent in everything that you do. Well, if you're thinking about yourself, you're going to be, polarized well well what about those what's he thinking about me what's she thinking about me do i look right don't worry they ain't thinking about you you know why because they're all thinking about themselves how do i how do i look how does my purse look do i have any toilet paper on my shoes you know they're, they're, they're all thinking about themselves but watch this what if you came in that's a that's a love that's centered on self what if you came in and you looked around and said, I wonder if they need a word of encouragement. I wonder if I can just kind of tell them how nice they look. Oh, I remember that, that man's daughter danced the other week. I just want to encourage him to just let him know how great that was. I wonder if that person needs a word from the Lord. That person there standing off by himself, I bet he just needs a friend, someone just to talk to. You're just like, whew, you understand? See, love that's focused on others has no fear. Love focused on yourself, great fear. So one of the things of a servant is you don't focus on yourself. You respond well when treated like a servant. You take initiative and you focus on other people. Those three things are really crucial in the days ahead to be people who are serving. You can apply that to anything. Apply that to your job. It'll fit. Apply that to your children. Apply that to your family. All those three things will fit. But especially make sure that you focus on other people, not on yourself. And that way, perfect love casts out what? All fear. Yeah. Because fear involves punishment. Or what are they going to think? They won't like me. There's always going to be a tension in faith. You're going to learn... How many of you probably have heard 100 sermons in your lifetime? Raise your hand. All right, look at that. All right. Okay, how about 200 sermons? Now, you should be the Pope by now. So your knowledge and your faith will kind of run sort of like this, all right? Hopefully it's continuing to go up. But it's going to be sort of like this. Now, here's the problem. Your behavior and your lifestyle is going to do this even though your faith keeps doing this this is called the tension of faith you see that in Romans chapter 7 it talks about although I really want to do well I don't the things I don't want to do I do the things that I, I want to do I don't who will free me from this wretched man? So this could be called behavior 
or lifestyle. And this is called your faith or your knowledge. Often we increase in knowledge, but we don't quite get our behavior to where we should be. How many of you understand this tension here? You say, my behavior is below my knowledge. Raise your hand. How many of you say, my behavior is way above my knowledge? Anybody? That's called pride. Okay, good. <laughs> now, you're always going to have this tension because you're going to have a discrepancy of this. This is called tension. Now, this here is not a bad thing. So long as the tension is an upward pull and not a downward pull. You see that? In the world today, in churches, here's the whole explanation of the apostasy of churches falling away from the faith. They take this line and match it to this so they feel better. No tension, right? So let's just accept everything because God loves us. Now, the behavior of the world is way down here. The behavior of worldly Christians is down here. But it's too hard because once you pull it this way, you lose a bunch of people. For many are the called, but few are chosen. They're gonna, the few are going to go up. A lot of people, even though God is calling them to himself, they're not going to follow because the world has too much of a pull on them. So down here is the world, the prince and power of the air. Now this here is called temptation. Pulling you into the image of the world. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you will know what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans chapter 12. So you see the dichotomy. You see the tension of faith here. So here's where the enemy wants you and me. This is the magnetic pull of the world. Now, you're going to have churches and people caught right in Middle Earth. Now they have to make a choice. And for a lot of people, the easier choice is pulling our faith and knowledge down to this. And then you have faith quasi-knowledge, compromise knowledge, but you feel better about yourself. Is that what you want? Well, in actuality, a lot of people do. We want to feel better about ourselves, right? So we know that the best way to do it is take the tension away. Do you want to remove that tension? How many say you should remove that tension? Raise your hand. How many say, no way? Raise your hand. How many say, I fear what the results may be if I raise my hand? Because you might sign me up to be an usher. Okay. Yeah, it is yes and no. It's a tough one. You want to resolve the tension, but you want to keep it. Because if you don't have upward tension, you never grow. If you don't have sunshine, you never push towards the sun. You're going to push towards wherever the sun is. So you want that tension this way all the time. Once you remove the tension, you don't have to learn anymore. You wouldn't get up, you wouldn't come here. Yeah? But can you have, you can have less tension you can have less tension, but it won't take it away because your faith and knowledge will now grow some more. And if you become so passive, God's not just going to pull you along like this. He wants a partnership where you walk with Christ <laughs> not get pulled along by Christ. Isn't that right? Because why? Because he wants your choice. He wants a partnership. He wants you to say yes to his command. You know what that's called? Obedience. And I feel like surrendering to the Holy Spirit requires a lot of effort too. It's not so easy to just surrender to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it takes a choice. 
It takes a decision. So that's why Paul said, I die daily. It's a daily choice. Many are called, but few are. Now, watch this. If Albert is called by the Lord, is he necessarily a chosen one? Yes and no. He is called, but every day you have to make the choice to be a part of that called group. You have to make a choice every day, a choice every day, because you can stop choosing, can't you? Yeah, you can just stop choosing. Uh, you can get discouraged. I remember some time ago, I was watching some Christians, and they were doing the stupidest things. You know that, by the way, uh, all of us, <laughs> let me just deviate for a second, and uh, all of us need, remember in Mark chapter 2, four friends carry this paralytic. Now, if you're a paralytic, which means you can't what? You can't walk. Or if you're a quad or quadriplegic, you can hardly move, right? So he's on this gurney, and his friends saw that Jesus was going to come. And so they said, we're going to take you to Jesus. So they carry him on a gurney. They go to Jesus, and there's not even room near the door. So they can't get in. They said, we're going to get you in. Well, Jesus is too busy, you know. No, we're going to get you in. Uh, We're going to climb on the roof and bust a hole. If you were the quadriplegic, you'd go, you, you guys ain't doing that. You are stupid. Do not do that. You know. No, we're going to do that. They duct tape you to the gurney. <laughs> no, you're not pulling me up on that stupid roof. Shut up. And they tape you on there. And they start, because they got to hoist you up, right? And you're going, what are you doing? Hey, if I could move, I'd punch all of you in the head. Just let me go. No, they're pulling this guy up on the roof. And now they're beating this roof and breaking a hole. You could just see this guy going, what are you doing? And, and then he, they let this guy down. And you, you see pictures of him being lay, let down horizontally. I don't think so. You know how big the hole would have to be for that? You know how they're going to lower him down? Like a mummy, right? Just Yeah, they're just going... Hey, hey, hi, everybody. Uh, hi. And he's got duct tape all around him, and they're bringing this vertical thing down, and then they lay it on the ground. Now, here's the cool thing. If you read it carefully, it says, and Jesus, seeing their faith. Not the paralytics. He looked up, and in this little hole, four faces. <laughs> and the Lord looked up, looked at this guy, put two and two together. And it said, and seeing their faith, he said, my son, your sins are forgiven. Listen carefully. Because we do stupid stuff, all of us, and you need to somehow write down, all of us need about four friends that even if you're sick, they'll do whatever it takes to get you to Jesus. If you're in a wrong woman's house, guy, and you've got an emotional affair going, woman, with some guy, you better have four friends that no matter how sick you are, will go in there and grab you out of the house. And if you say, hey, what are you doing? They punch your head and say, shut up. And they push you in the car like they're kidnapping you. And even though you're kicking, they punch your legs. They put duct tape around your legs. They put you in the car and they get you to Jesus. Every single one of us needs those kinds of friends. You have any of those? You better. You know why? Because I really believe that every single one of us is about one step away from stupid. Isn't that right? One stupid decision in your marriage, that's it. One stupid decision because somebody hoodwinked you into some financial investment. You're done. One stupid decision about something you're... You need somebody to, how many men here are under 35 years old? Raise your hand. Under 35, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, all right, good, good, all right. All right, let's go. How many under 55? Raise your hand. All right, okay. Hey, listen, there's sometimes you need to have somebody grab you by the collar and say, you got more testosterone than you got brains right now. Shut up and come with me. Because there's going to be times in your life you're going to get sick. You're going to be sick in your marriage. You're going to get sick of your faith. You're going to get sick of going to church. 
You're going to get sick of serving. You're going to get sick of worship. And I just need somebody to grab me and say, come, come. We need to get you to Jesus. What do you need? Get me away. There's sometimes uh, some of my friends, and John is one of them right over here, my executive pastor. They'll say, you need a break. Get out of here. You know, there's times you need to grab Gary and kick him out. And, uh, <laughs> and, and send him out, because we won't go on our own. But you need to grab him and say, here's a ticket. You know, you get out of here for five days. Go. Done. You're, you've already, you know, uh, sort of covertly worked with his wife on all of this so that it's a sneak attack. And then and get him out. Because sometimes servants are so committed to something they can, they can sin on the top side. Many people sin on the bottom side. Your pastor will not sin with adultery or drugs or, oh, well, maybe, uh, <laughs> or going into alcoholism. But what we'll do is we'll sin on the top side. Overwork, pushing too hard, destroying our emotional equilibrium, then getting edgy at home because we're tired and fatigued and depleted and burnt out. See, the devil doesn't care what side of the boat you go off. Pharisees sinned on the top side. Over-legalism, being harsh and self-righteous. But it was all holy, 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 right? They didn't go off on the bottom side. You know, see any Pharisees in the Bible went clubbing or drinking <laughs> with the girls? No, no. no. Now, worldly people may sin on that side, but it doesn't mean religious people don't sin too. They just sin on the top side. They gossip, they slander, they talk about people, they judge people, self-righteous. Okay, which one is better? Both are bad. See, but the devil knows he can't get you guys and some you ladies to sin on the bottom side. That's the dark side, bad side, see? But you can sin on this side over here. He doesn't care what side of the boat you go off, so long as you go off. So we, as God's people, need four friends that'll just grab us, and however sick we are, doesn't matter what side, no matter how sick you are, they've got to get you to Jesus if they have to duct tape you. You need to be able to write those names down. If you don't have one, then you need to start finding them. Remember in John, <clears throat> was it John... Uh, Five, is it, or John 15, uh, we find the pool of Bethesda, and there was a man that was laying there for 38 years, Vern, 38 years in his condition. And Jesus came to him and said, uh, do you want to be healed? And this man said, oh, I've been here 38 years. And uh, when the stirring of the water takes place, there's no one there to throw me in. Is that John 5? Did you get it? I think it's John 5. Okay. And uh, there's no one there to throw me in. And when I read that, I thought, what have you been doing for 38 years? You don't even have a friend to throw you in. 38 years there. You made no friends? And some of us are over 38 years, and we probably have, we're hard-pressed to write down four names, guys or women that will grab me out of another lady's house and drag me out, throw me in the car punch me and say, you get to Jesus, we're taking you in. Do you have like a band of brothers? See, people aren't coming to church to, to find a friendly church. Friendly churches are everywhere. You know what they're coming for? They're coming to a church where they can find friends. Because we need friends. That kind of friends, a band of brothers. Otherwise, the only thing you have in, in common with each other is that you go to the same church and you're a Christian. Well, when push comes to shove, that, that doesn't hold. You have to have a band of brothers, a band of sisters, don't you? That's why small groups are so important, because it allows you the environment to start developing. Friendliness? No. Friendships that last forever. This last week, uh, I went over to the Big Island, did some diving and some throw net over at uh, South Point. Uh, it's a, by Kealakakua Bay. It's on the Big Island with uh, some friends and our sons people that I've known for 30 years that started in New Hope Hilo with me back when I was 31 years old. 
And so we try to, once in a while, get together to keep that friendship strong. And we can walk right into each other's life. You need to be able to walk into somebody's life and say, Bob, how's your conscience? Albert, how's your conscience? Is it healthy? Or are you letting it go flat? How's your conscience? How's your marriage? No, tell me truly. How's your marriage? How you doing? What are you going to do over the next five years of your life? Do you have a life plan at all? What are you going to do when you retire? What are you going to do when you get out of high school or college? What is God calling you to do? What's your passion? Oh, I don't know. I've just got to make some money. No, oh, that's a terrible goal in life. Just to, to, to invest your whole life in just the accumulation of money that disappears? It's got to be far deeper than that. But, but you see, you need those friends to just push you like that. And that's what the church doesn't have. Everybody needs that. Because we're all one step away from stupid. So you need a friend. Now remember, that guy was 38 years near the pool of Bethesda. 38 years and he had no friend. I was thinking, you know, the time to build friends is not in the crisis. It's way before the crisis. Because each of us are going to hit a crisis. You're going to be sick in your marriage. You're going to get sick in your faith. You're going to get sick of church. But you have better built friends before that. Because if you get sick and you haven't built friends, you will bail out. That's why we look around and we say, hey, where's so-and-so? Where's brother so-and-so? Where's sister? I don't know. They haven't been here for six, eight months. They didn't have friendships that were deep and they, they, they just got tired of the church, tired of their marriage, or tired, and boop, they're gone. See, we need that adhesive, that arm around my shoulder that says, no, you're not going to do that. But I want to. No, you're not going to do that. Okay. Come, let's talk. It could save your future. We're all about one step away from stupid. That's why we need one another. I got real discouraged. I was going home. I saw some Christians doing stupid stuff, and I said to my wife on the way home from church, I said, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. <laughs> she said, what? I said, I know I'm a pastor, but I don't want to be a Christian anymore. She said, why? I said, because they're so dumb. <laughs> She said, well, what are you talking about? And I gave a couple of examples and some people doing real stupid stuff. And, and I tell them they don't listen. And it's biblical. They, don't re they reject the Bible, but they still want to go to church. I said, if they don't want to listen to the Bible, why are they in church? These Christians are weird. They're schizo. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Then I kind of laughed. I said, I'll follow Jesus, but don't call me a Christian. They're weird. <laughs> And then she said, she laughed. She said, oh, I understand what you're saying. I said, yeah. But we've got to change the dichotomy where we're okay to live here even though we know our faith is up here. People have learned to, to live with that tension, and what they do is they pull this down to here, honey, and they still call themselves Christians. There should be a tension in our life, and it should be a healthy tension. You know what that's called? Conscience. That's called growth. It's called being like Jesus. Doesn't, we, doesn't it say in the book of Colossians, it says, therefore, set your mind on things above and not on things beneath. Therefore, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are right, Philippians says, whatever thing is, is good and reputable, of good report, let your mind dwell on these things and the peace of God will be with you. Oh, well, there's a tension though, yeah, but the peace of God can still function in the midst of tension because you're going the right way. Each of us will have that tension, and we have to be able to be okay with that so long as it's pulling us this way, even if it's ever so slightly. This is called growth. Let me ask you the question. Are you still struggling over the things you struggled with last year? Are you still tripping over the things you tripped over last year? You need to give in to Christ. Here's one of the best things you can do is give in to Christ. Start to give in to it. Just admit, say, yeah, I've been stupid in this area, been dumb in that area, I've been holding on to some bad thoughts here. I have a bad habit of this or habit of that. And so I just admit it. And I let God's mercy pull me. 
I don't want you to say, that's it, then I'm just going to go work for Christ. Oh, it's okay, but then it's still based on your own power, your own ability. Here, when you say, God, you spoke to my heart, I'm going to change my behavior. It may not be sinful, it just might be not good, not being punctual, or, or saying yes like this, and in the inside saying, you an idiot. That's what you do. Oh, yes, yes, you stupid person, you. Yes, that's why Japanese always go like this, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Hi, hi, so this is so Shimasho, you stupid person. You want such bakatare ne? Hi, you very nice person, you stupid, ugly person. <laughs> So long as we're giving in. So instead of saying, I'm just going to work for God, here's a better way. Instead of saying, I'm going to work for God, say, God, come work through me. I'm going to live for God. Lord, today, come live through me. When I enter that church, who needs love? Yeah, who needs a word of encouragement? Who needs prayer? And just start looking. And you'll see someone by themselves or someone just fixing coffee by themselves and just kind of looking around. Someone burying their head in the bulletin because they have no friends, nobody else. Someone just, you know, by themselves. Just stop. Say, hi, my name is. You doing all right? Yeah, hey, sit with me. This your first time? Oh, yeah, second time. Oh, good. Come, I'll introduce. And then here's one of the best things. Hey, let me introduce you to some people. See what that person is like. If they're Japanese, introduce them to some Japanese people. If they're young, introduce them to young people. Just get them connected up so they can find friendly people. No, friends, possible friends, a band of brothers that will help them. Might change their future forever. You have no idea. They might be that far away from bailing out. But if you will be a radiance of God's life and love, remember, perfect love casts out all fear, then you'll understand what it means to be a servant that leads in serving. That gives life. Doesn't just set up a chair. It gives life away. That's why you're so incredibly important. The pastor's going to be up here in the side room getting his sermon ready. The musicians are tuning the guitars up. Who's giving life away? You. Who's looking for those that need love and ministry? You. I will be found among those who serve. And if nobody's serving... People come to a friendly church, but they don't find life. Jesus never said, come to church and I'll give you forgiveness. He never said, church will give you healing. He never said, church will give you a new start. He said, I will give you a new start. I'll give you forgiveness. I'll give you a new beginning. But I'm going to work through servant leaders that are serving because I will be found among those who? That's why you're so incredibly important. And then we do it church as a team. Pastor Gary or Pastor Greg, they're doing what they're assigned to do. Get a message ready for us all. Musicians are doing what they're supposed to do. Question is, are we doing what we're supposed to do? Are we just coming to observe or consume or spectate? No. Remember this. In New Hope, as privileged as I am to have been called as a pastor of that church, it's a great calling. But you're also called to this church, aren't you? Yeah, if you're not called here, don't be here. But you're called here. You're called to be servants, and that's why you're here this morning. Now watch this. Your calling to be a part of this church is not a lesser calling than his calling to be the pastor of this church. His, his calling is not a greater calling than yours. We're all called. That's why we do church as a team, and that's what makes us one body. We're not spectating. A few performers do the thing, do their thing. We are a team. We are a body of Christ. So you have gifts, you have passions, but most of all, you have a chosen calling that you choose every day. And I choose that. Many are called, few are the chosen ones. That's what it means in the Bible. It means every day I got to choose that calling. I got to choose that. Because it's so easy to unchoose. Remember, we're just one step away from saying something, doing something stupid. We're just that close. So I choose that calling today. Is it easy? No. Sometimes I get up in the morning and I am tired. I am sick. I'm ready to bail. But I, I know I've got to get to church. Why? Because I choose that calling. And so will you. 
like the mother that said to her son, get up. He said, I don't want to get up. No, it's church today. He said, I know, but I ain't going. She said, why? Nobody listens to me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody, nobody even knows I'm alive over there. She said, you get up. We're going to church. He said, no. She said, first of all, people do listen to you. They do care about you. They do love you. And not only that, you're the pastor. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of times I don't want to get up my wife says get up they don't listen to me there anyway <laughs> but you have to choose that don't you you have to choose to get back here now it's going to be easy now because it's a new facility but fast forward the tape three years Let's say it doesn't grow as fast as you'd like it to, or people bail out when they shouldn't bail out, or people that you hoped would be ushers don't usher. Greeters don't greet. Musicians aren't musical. <laughs> you know, they do things wrong. Sounds bad. You're embarrassed. Now you still have to choose your calling, and then you'll get through it. So you understand the tension of faith? Here it is, the tension of faith. And so you'll live with it just so long as it's pulling up this way and it's getting smaller and smaller, but then you're going to keep growing this way anyway, so you'll have to constantly deal with the ebb and flow of that tension. And it's okay because it's good for my soul. If you ever feel yourself pulling this way or pulling this down, careful. You don't want God to change. You want you to change. And as soon as you start changing God, that's called the beginning of the apostasy or the falling away. And you'll see that in churches today. I've seen it in the Presbyterian Church, or the, some areas, of, not all, but this is Methodist Church, UCC, Lutheran Church, all of those, they're starting to go this way. And that's the way of the world. And you'll see our government leaders saying, what's wrong with this? Let's pull this down and endorse this. So let's get everybody's stuff down to here. And if you're not, then you're a bigot, you're condescending, you're judgmental. Now, we have to make sure that we don't sin over the top side either, right? We have to make sure that we're not doing exactly what they're accusing us to do. So the balance here is real critical, but make sure that there's always an upward tension. And then be the people that understand how to respond when you're treated like a servant. Don't be afraid to initiate that servant, and make sure that you're light of God's love. And it's not a selfish love. It's a love that focuses on somebody else, not yourself, because perfect love casts out all fear. And people come here with a lot of fear. They need servants that understand perfect love. Okay, we're going to pause. I want to give you time for some questions. So if you have questions about anything in the world, you just ask Pastor Gary. <laughs> the easy ones I'll take, so go ahead. No, just any question about church, about life, about faith, about uh, marriage, about whatever. You're so, you're so busy in, in life trying to make income or do life and you want to serve in ministry, it's, it's a tug of war. It's such a battle. Sure how, how, do you, how do you redirect to try to be more servant? Yep, very good question. By the way, you have to be okay with tension in your life and sometimes ambivalence. Which way do I go? Which way do I go? I don't have everything settled yet. But you have to be able... I, I was reading a book by Jeff Gelb. It's called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, of course, is one of the greatest geniuses of our time. Innovative creative, he uh, discovered a bunch of stuff, he made things. I mean, it's just amazing what he's done. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci has one principle about thinking in, in a genius way, and that is a genius is able to be comfortable with ambivalence, which means we're not in yet, we're still in a temporary situation, it's okay. Ambivalent. Some people say, no, i got to be either or. Well, be careful. It makes it nice on you, but you can't, if you can't live with ambivalence, then you will not be able to lead people because most people are in the midst of something ambivalent. 
they're on the way to something. Their, their kids haven't graduated yet. They're still paying. They're wanting it to be done. The, the student is not graduated yet. He's waiting for a job and it's not coming through. He's got the, everybody's living in middle ground somewhere. So we have to be okay with that. It's okay. And you find your peace in Christ, not in circumstances. It's all right. It's all right. So you're going to have that. Uh, the first is it's okay to have that tension because it's a healthy tension. Otherwise, our passions will pull us over the edge, not only in good ways, but negative ways. Men and women have passions, sexual passions, yearnings, passions. All, and if you just say, go with your heart, you're in big trouble. And there's tons of songs that say, just follow your heart. Are you kidding? <laughs> the heart of man is wicked above all things, the scripture says. So no, you, you go with what Jesus says sh your heart should be, not just your heart. Your heart is untrained. When you come to Christ, you gave your heart to Christ, but you still have strings attached. You still have desires and passions. That's just part of our anatomy, our biology. So you have to be careful. So you're going to have that tension. So what you do is you make sure that everything is balanced. So if you're married, you speak to your wife, how many hours can we give? We can give four hours a week, six hours a week, five hours a week. Great. Where do we want to spend those hours? And then you fight guilt like crazy. Oh, we could spend more, you know, like we're sh like Schindler. I could have saved one more. I could have saved one more. No, it's just, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do five hours. And then if we agree on and it's okay, let's do something together. That's a little bit more. Maybe we have time one week. We'll do that. But let's commit just to five hours. And we can give like an offering of more time. But we better stick with five. Great. So then you commit to that, because some weeks you don't want to spend any. You got mad at somebody in the ushers or somebody, and you know, <laughs> and uh, you say, I, I ain't going to go there. I'm not going to be a Christian. And your, <laughs> your wife says, no, 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 no. we're, we're going to go. You committed to five. Let's go five. Okay, wonderful for growth. Now, by the way, and then I'll get your question. If you are unmarried or you're an empty nester, the bulk of the ministry here at South Bay should be on your shoulders. If you're married with kids, be very careful because your most important ministry is your spouse and your children. You lose them, it doesn't matter if you're in ministry. That's why Paul says, at this time he was single, we don't know if his wife passed away or whatever, but he said, I wish you all would be as me. But if you're married, you have concerns about your spouse and your children. So your interests are divided. But if you're like me, you can give full devotion to Christ. So if you're a college student and you're not married or your uh, kids are gone, or if you're a couple and you can do it together, like we talked about, great. If you have kids, you want to make sure your first priority is with them. Be careful so long as everything stays in balance now. And then if you are married with kids, my suggestion is don't leave your kids at home. If you're going to be involved in ministry, plug them into your hip pocket. Take them with you. Uh, when I was early on in ministry, I was traveling to the Philippines, to Japan, all over the world. And I said to them, if you want me to speak, you buy me two tickets. Oh, we don't have the budget, and I ain't coming. Why two tickets? Because I want my son or my daughter to come with me. And so my son Aaron, my two daughters, they'd been with me to Israel, to Europe, to the Philippines, to Japan. To... And so today, all of them are serving Christ. My son's in ministry, pastoring a church just about 20 miles away from us. My other two girls serve Christ. My daughter Amy serves with me in the ministry. Uh, so she's... Uh, part-time with the, the ministry. She's got two kids, but she does the journals, you know, the life journals and the artwork and everything and the custom journals. So my kids are in ministry and partly because when dad was growing up, I didn't shield them from my faith. I included them in my faith. So after a while, my son was saying, dad, are you going to speak anywhere in the world? <laughs> And so when God put a call in his life, he said, absolutely, it's thrilling to be in ministry. Why? Because I just plugged him into my hip pocket. So if you're an uh, empty nester or if you're a single guy, uh, no kids, you can have more time in ministry. 
if you've got kids, be careful so that you don't lose them. And then if you are in ministry, plug them into your hip pocket. Okay, yes. Yeah. It's on. It's on. They... Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm in a very corporate environment where I compromise quite a bit to perform my job. And so I find myself um, having a difficult time modeling after Jesus. So if you have any words of encouragement or advice for people in the corporate world that deal with this tension, your insight would be greatly appreciated. You bet. There's uh, three things that you want to model when you're in the corporate world, and they can all start with C, and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> let me start with this one. It's character. This one's competence. And this one's culture. Now let me explain each of these. You start with competence. If you're in the corporate world, they're going to really rate you on this box the most. They don't care what you do after 5 o'clock. You can go weird, right? You can be a transvestite. You can be a cross-dresser. They don't care because 5 to, to 8 in the morning, you can do whatever you want to. But 8 to 5, you better be super competent. Okay, so one of the things that you can do, first of all, is make sure that you're really competent. That's where they put their litmus test. You don't want to be a slothful, not punctual, poor worker that tries to get as much pay for as little work as they can do. You don't want to do that. You want to be the best there is there. So you want to be someone, you say, well, I only make, you know, 20 bucks an hour or something, so I'm going to give 20 buck uh, performance. No, no, you give $50 to $60 performance, because then when the promotion comes, it's going to match that way. But if you're making minimum wage and you've been making that for 15 years, there's a reason why, because all you give is minimum wage. I've got some people on staff that they don't get paid very much. They ain't going to get paid more, because that's all they want to do. They don't want to do any more, so that's what you get paid. But I have other people that give what they're paid for and more, when time for promotion comes, I want to give them more. Because if I look around and they're hardly in the office, they're hardly doing anything, it's just like, i got to hire somebody else to be in the office because you ain't. So now you're costing me twice as much. Because i got to hire somebody to do what you're not doing. And if I keep asking Bob to do something, and he says, oh, I can't, I can't, i got to hire Albert to do what he can't do. Now he's costing me too much money, right? Because I've got to add his salary to his. Cause, but if he would have done that, if he would have done everything, when time, time come for promotion, I'd have given him a bunch more because he's doing the job of two people. Right? So competency is huge. And I'd suggest that for every corporation, anybody here, you just be the best. Study hard. If they say, do you know, you know, Microsoft Word, or do you know... Um, you know, Excel. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Do you know Excel? Uh-huh. Okay. Come over here. Why didn't you say, I don't, but I'll learn it. Give me a couple weeks, and I'm going to find out those who learn uh, no Excel, and I'm going to get tutored. Give me just some time, and I'll get it for you. Boss says, dude, all right. And then would you learn PowerPoint? Absolutely. I'll learn Keynote. Okay, great. All right. Yeah. Pretty soon, you're really improving yourself in your competency because you're an avid student. Remember this, life will not give you what you think you deserve. Life will not give you what you expect to earn. Life will give you whatever you settle for. So if you settle for, this is good enough for me, it's all they're paying me for, that's what you're going to get. But if I say, no, you know, I'm not just going to be a pastor 
I'm going to figure out how to lead people, how to teach people, how to write books, how to develop resources, uh, plant churches, develop young leaders. And it's like, whoa, you don't have to do all those things. We just expected you to preach once a week. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, a uh, lot more. So number one is competency. Because if you try to share your faith and you're a real dodo kind of person, forget it. I wouldn't even listen to you, and I'm a Christian. <laughs> so the other is, without compromising, you have to understand the culture of the organization. Now, without compromising, which means, say, the boss is a little edgy, it's okay. That's just his culture, right? It's his management style. You don't want to sit in the, the lunchroom and gripe about him. That's his management style. I'm not here. My, they're not paying me to be his executive coach. They're paying me to do things competently. That's out of my pay raise. That's out of my pay scale. So other people don't love to do this, see? So when it comes time to promote you, you think I'm going to promote you if you're one of those? Forget it. When it comes time for cutting, you're on my short list. So... You want to make sure that you've got the culture down and the, the company, how, how, what their DNA is, how they want you to respond. If you're selling cars for Ford, don't drive a Chevy. You know, just, just, you know, just real simple things, right? It's just like just the way water runs down the hill. It's not that hard to see the culture and fit in with it. It's not that hard. Okay? Everybody got that? Hey, just, that's just the way water runs down the hill for this company. They're not asking you to be immoral or this or that. When that happens, then you have to learn something different. It's called appealing to authority. Appealing to authority. You don't tell them. You don't grumble. You appeal. You know, you, you said to tell this customer we don't have this product when we do. Um, could you let me explain it to him in a way that he understands we can't sell this to him because another customer has already spoken for it, but we have it on back order. So instead of just saying we don't have it, can I, I can take care of it. And if anything is found out, we will be known as a company of integrity and not one that doesn't have integrity. But I promise you I'll do it well. If somebody appealed to me like that and I were a non-Christian, I, I want to keep you. That's pretty cool, because in my heart of hearts, I'd rather do it right, but I don't know how to, so just lie to them. I've always done it that way. Yeah, so I expect you to, because as a boss, you know what you do? You always start at your starting point, right? So I was raised, my parents let me lie to get ahead. Lie to them, just tell them we don't have it. So if you go, okay, then you don't have competency that I need. I want, I want people that are sharp. That when you're done talking to me because you appealed to me, you didn't just polish my boots. You didn't just, yes, man. You said, let me serve you and increase the integrity of our company. You know what you did? You just contributed to my company. And if you can contribute to an organization, contribute to an organization, you're worth your weight in gold. Now, when it comes to character... You, here's where your faith comes in, because it's a part of this, right? It's not really a part of competence. You can be really incompetent and still go to heaven. <laughs> you can not know how to, you know, you, like, duh, I work for Ford. I'm driving a Toyota. I was like, oh, what's wrong with that? And so your culture could be way off. But here, this ties in with your faith, because if you know Christ, you better have integrity. Because if you said yes over here to lying and try to sh have them come to church, I, I know you, I, you did what I told you to, but it doesn't match up when you tell me to come to church. So it, it behooves you to think integrous because this is going to come up right here. And here's where you have character when people in your office give you a hard time on this or that. You love them in return. I have a, I've always got a motto, and it's this. Love people until they ask you why. You love people until they ask you, why are you doing this? That guy just stabbed you in the back and you give him money? Uh-huh. Why? Because the scripture says, and I know you might not believe in the Bible, but the Bible says, do not be overcome with evil. Overcome evil by doing good. 
The only way I can diffuse that is to do good. Not to be neutral, not to slander, but to do good. Yeah, because that coworker doesn't even like you and you just brought him a latte. <laughs> uh, because I know she likes lattes and this is the way, you know, and it's all right. We're trying to make friends. Well, she doesn't deserve it. Neither do I, but we got to. And then they go, who are you? Then you say, I learned this from somebody. Who? His name is Jesus. Then they go, ooh, she's competent. Ooh, she's smart. I want to go find out what she believes. You understand? Now listen to this. Good works, a good will, because you want to build good will, right? So I'll put, start it this way. Good will, good works, opens people to the good news. Goodwill, culture, plus good works, competency, not slothfulness or laziness or lacking punctuality or making excuses or blaming everybody. Goodwill, good works, makes them open to the good news. But if you start with good news and you don't have goodwill and you don't have good works, you won't have good news. They go, you Christians are all alike. Here it's weird. That's why, that's why I don't want to be a Christian anymore. <laughs> I just want to follow Jesus. Good, next. Does that help? You bet. Good. Somebody else? Great question. Yes, please. New Hope grew very, very quickly uh, from the early days even until recently. Can you tell us a little bit about how it grew and what kind of challenges you faced, how you managed that growth? I mean, if, if our church, by God's grace, grows quickly, I'm just wondering what are some of the things that we ought to be aware of? What are things we ought to look for? How do we prepare for that? What do we do? Yeah. Um, are you talking about how to grow or if it grows, what do we do? If it grows, what do we do? Yeah, and, and maybe related to the growth that New Hope experienced in the early days. Yeah. Um, when you get to about 800... Uh, you're going to hit a ceiling. You're going to growth block. 800 to 1,000, uh, you, you hit a growth block. It, it, it just stops. And uh, what that is saying is uh, up, up to about five 600 is just preaching. If you just preach pretty good, people are going to come. They don't have to be connected in any way. It's just a, a Sunday-only church because you're a good preacher and people want to hear and it stirs their hearts and gives them a boost and a kick for the week. If you're going above that and you hit another block, uh, growth ceiling we call it, about 800, 900, that part is organization. Things aren't organized because it's like, what's the next step? How do I get involved in this? How do, is it easy? Is it convenient? Do you have brochures? Everything you do, and I've told John and the others, you have to almost communicate the same thing five ways before they catch it. You tell it from the pulpit, put it in the bulletin, put it on PowerPoint, you make a brochure about it, put it on the web. And then they say, I think they have a men's group this Saturday. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and when you're sick and tired of telling people something, they're just starting to get it. But we abandon that because I'm sick and tired of telling everybody. I already told them. that They haven't even gotten it yet. So always remember five ways before people get it, not just one. Oh, I said it in the bulletin. Yeah, put it in the bulletin. Yeah, but there's like 90% of the congregation doesn't read. <laughs> they look at the pictures in the bulletin and they throw it away. <laughs> so five ways. So the, the uh, growth breaking, uh, the, uh, uh, how you break that ceiling is much better organization, uh, clear signage, uh, people who guide Organization, parking safety team, a newspaper advertisement, market, everything organized. So a passerby goes, that's what I got to do. Got it. Poof. So you simplify everything, make it clean, clear. In fact, John, who's uh, our executive pastor, uh, his whole thing is quality control. So I'm just going to walk around and say, we don't have any signage, that parking is bad. And what, how are we going to optimize parking? How are we going to optimize our shuttles? Uh, we, we had parking everywhere, but people can't find it because they don't know unless they're oriented to it. 
they have no idea where the parking is because it's like a quarter mile away. And then we shuttle. Well, if you're a new person, you have no idea. Organization. Where are you going to come? If you're a new person, what's the first place you're going to drive to? A shuttle point? No. Where are you going to drive? Church. Church. That's where you're starting and you, you give out parking maps. Uh, even if we say, this is where you park on Sunday, you haven't gotten the new persons. If there's 50 new people coming, they haven't heard it. It's those 50 cars that are going to look around and go home. So we have to capture the new ones. Organization. Organization. Organizing your ministries, brochures about it. Think it through. How does water run down this hill? If you come into the church, where's the water going next? What's your next step? Well, salvation. Think? Yeah, okay. Okay. If they say yes, what's the next step? I mean... Think through every step until there are leaders sitting right here on a Saturday morning. And then you think of leadership training. Who are you going to bring in? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that thing? How are you going to train them? Is it going to be something systematic training? So all of those things. Because I bet if, if you have a ceiling, I bet I can show you right where you stopped putting in effort. Because then everybody there is oriented. They're all, you know... Sort of like initiated. So the initiated are fine. They come back. But the new ones have a hard time finding that entry. And then after they get entry, what do they do after that? So we get excited about Joe Blow coming for the first time, second time, fifth time. Where is he? But Susie here is first time, second. And we start getting excited about first, second, third time. But it's the 15th time, 100th time. That's what you want to move it to. So you've got to give them steps. So it's organization. And right with organization, when you hit, you hit a thousand, it's parking. Parking. Because your parking spaces are full, and so people just aren't going to fight the crowds, especially if they're afraid of church. I'm at the edge of my life. I don't know what to do, but I don't know about church. But I'm going to give it a try, but I can't get in. So they'll go somewhere else. And they might find another church that has parking. That's all right. God will use that church. But if you want God to use this church, you have to think through that. And then above that is staffing. Those that are full-time on staff have to be people of character, competence, and culture. Same thing. It's organization, same thing. And you have to make sure that you know how to hire and fire and move people, shuffle the deck, John, how many times have I shuffled the deck with our staff? Because we have to move people in their sweet spots. So, you, And does that happen right at the beginning? Mm -mm. No, maybe after 10 years you start to see, this guy is real competent here, that one's changing that way, her heart is going this way. So what do you do? Just say, shut up and stay where I put you in the beginning. Well, things change. And it takes leadership to say, Let's move you here and let's move you into there. Sometimes even good people get tired. Uh, we've had one girl, her name is Arlene. She's been in, in one role for such a long time, about 12 years. She's just tired of it. So we moved her into another one, just gave her a new life. Because she's learning new stuff now. Sometimes you just shuffle the deck just to keep people fresh. So that would be some things on growth. And then, of course, this stuff is real important because you are the ones that are out there doing the ministry while the others are. You know, if you've got Greg or Gary or musicians, they're doing stuff, right? They're oh, getting things ready for Sunday. Nobody's out there loving on people. You have to do that. That's your role. Good. Questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what happens if the the promotion or the raise isn't there? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, you give all, you give your all, you give your life, and there's just nothing there. Yeah. In return. That so. that can be a very discouraging thing um, for people because we're just human, mm -hmm. and we we expect um, some kind of affirmation if you work really hard. And that's where the maturity comes in. It's real tough. 
but uh, this one I have to work gently with because it would frustrate me as well, and it has when I've seen that take place. That's where you come back to your knees and you say, did you call me to be a part of this? Then my reward must be something other than a paycheck. And you have to see things into a higher state, even if they're not. You could have a butthead boss. <laughs> and, but you can't say the reality is you're a butthead boss. No, you can't say that. Uh, because what is true is not necessarily the truth. That's going to sound funny. But he never said what is true will set you free. He said the truth will set you free. It's something larger. It's much deeper than the butthead boss. It's something God's going to do in you, through you, thorn in the flesh to keep you humble. I know if God maybe did something huge and affluent, you know, I was like that 84-year-old lady that won that Powerball thing. Of, she got a what, full takeout of 200 million or something plus. Uh, if God may do that, we, we go weird. Yeah, we just abandon everything. As Solomon said, you know, don't give me so much that I deny thee, and don't give me so little that I steal. Just give me the food that is my portion. And God may say, you don't see the end from the beginning, but I do. And your best of your best is going to be right in here. One day in heaven, I'll fast forward the tape for you and show you what would have been if you got tons. Now watch. And you go, oh, I said that. I did that. I made that decision. Because everything God does is out of love. Everything. So he says, now you know why I stopped you right here. Yeah, thank you, God. You loved me when I didn't even see it. Yeah. So I know God's going to show you the videotape one day. So at that point, you say, you know, God has a reason for this. So I'm going to start to rejoice in what I have, do really good in what I do. I'm going to work these three things here, make sure that I'm not compromising in my competence. Can I do things better? Can I do it better? Can I do it cheaper? Can I you know, help people. Can I use my character to help people on the job? And pretty soon you're a shining light in that place. And I tell you, if someone's a shining light on my staff and their attitude is good and their, their culture is good and their competency is good and their culture, it doesn't matter if, uh, I mean, yeah, their character. If, if, if budget gets real thin, they're the last people I'll cut. I'll find money for them. But there's a bunch on the short list. And a lot of it is the same thing as corporate world. Competency, they ain't that good. Culture, they don't understand what I'm trying to ask them to do. They don't catch the culture of new hope. It's like do as little as I can, get as much as I can, and I'm out of here. So I'll do good in what you assign me, but I ain't going to do any more than what you assign me. So that's why you don't get any more than what you're getting. Right? And then character, if they're blaming or they're a little bitter or they're a little gossipy, and then they say, how come I don't get a raise? I can't tell you what, why, but I just say, oh, we don't have the budget yet. Hmm, you get mad. <laughs> but there's a reason. That's where you got to go to your knees and say, Lord, it's not him. It's me somewhere. Yeah. And then God's going to leave you there for a season because he loves you more than you'll ever know. Now you say, but what if I do have a butthead boss? Then see it better than that. Scripture for you is Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be filled with light. If your eye is bad, or your perspective, you see things into a lower state. If your eye is bad, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is dark, how great shall that darkness be? It'll affect everything about you. So I, I would uh, take that as a scripture and then keep going with these three things here. Try to be the best you can in competency. You know, this here, this here. Okay. Good. Great question. Yes. Wow. Excellent. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you have... <laughs> it's all right. Oh, it's getting emotional. I did. 
I just wondered if New, Hap New Hope had a resource for something like this. And it's, um, I belong to um, a team that goes out and does evangelizing. Mm -hmm. We pass out tracks. Yep. And these are to people that we don't know at all. Um, so it's somewhat easy. Mm -hmm. But um, I know there's a lot of us that we can invite friends and relatives to church. But I know in our lives there's a lot of other people that we would like to touch, but we can't. Mm -hmm. And whether it's because it's not feasible, feasible or it's just, um, just something that we know won't happen. I mean, we can pray for them, but, when, but knowing that there could be something else out there that we could do mm -hmm. to um, bring the gospel to these people. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was thinking and I've been trying to do is to write to my friends and relatives mm -hmm. to give them the information they need so that if they ever would be open to it, that they might accept um, the information being the gospel. Um, but I've been having so much trouble trying to customize every letter to every person. And sometimes I feel like I give too much information mm -hmm. about, you know, why I believe in the Bible or mm -hmm. why they should believe. And I was just wondering, it's getting easier now. Okay. <laughs> so I was just wondering if, Breathe. <laughs> if, if there's anything that your church already has that would help people like me who want to write and to reach mm -hmm others th that they love and want to bring them to, you know, people. I have a lot of Buddhists in my family. Mm -hmm. I want to reach those people. I have um, some atheists mm -hmm. and some agnostics. I have some people that are on the, on the verge that only they're seeking. But um, I don't know. I just, there's so much information out there. I don't know how much to give them or how much not to give them. Sure. I try to write a personal letter and include yeah. a track, but I still... You know, I'll, I'll write a letter and I end up not sending it out to them because I just feel like it's not right yet. And I, I, I don't know. I, is there a resource that you have yeah. in your church yeah. to help people like me? First of all, let me give you this. 10% of the people in a church will have the gift of evangelism. Now, 10%, 90% have other gifts. Other gifts. Now... All of these, the scripture says, must do the work of an evangelist. But they don't have the gift of evangelism. These people here have a huge passion for the lost and often will give them way more than they should get. It's like Chinese food. You get tons of noodles and, you know, and rice, and I can't eat all of that, but they keep giving it to me. And... Uh, it's just way too much. So this is like a Chinese restaurant here. This here, they do the work in evangelists. Now, do you remember in a mall, like you have a kiosk, and uh, it'll say, you know, it has all these different things, and you go here, and this department store is here, and it's a map, and it says, big red sign, you are here. Now, when you look at this thing here, you always start right there, right? Because that's where you are. The danger of you having as strong a gift as you would have is you always think everybody is here. So how come you're not as committed as I am to this ministry? Because I really am, and you're absolutely convinced. But you have, you have to understand that you have to start with everybody at their starting point, not at yours. Otherwise, you'll have a distorted view of ministry. And it'll ha cause you to be upset with others because they're not nowhere near as committed as you are. When they really are, but at different starting points. So number one, I say to those with a gift of evangelism, only 10% have a gift of evangelism, but don't start at your starting point. Start at their starting point. So, number one. Number two, find out how to do the work, how you can give them simple ways to do the work of an evangelist. And that won't be the way you're doing it. 
See, you can pass out tracts. No way in the world will I pass out tracts. Because statistically, 1% read the tract. The rest go into the rubbish can. I don't have enough money to print that many tracts where 99.9% .9 of them are going to get thrown away. So it used to be when it was four spiritual laws, they would read it a little more. That was like 5%. Now it's down to 1%. Because it's just an archaic way of doing it. People don't do it that way. The only people huckstering pamphlets are those trying to sell something in Waikiki. So they, they put us in that same category, right? So I got to figure out another way to do it. And so now an evangelist has to rethink a lot of that stuff. So it's the same goal, change your approach. Same goal, change your approach. Because times change. The way people's language, you know, when um, you're 39, and so, but when you were like 15, the people on the street spoke a different language. That was the language you learned. You go on the street and try to speak that, hey, far out. So, <clears throat> how far out? <laughs> it's a whole different language. And the things you were concerned with when you were 20 or 30, they don't even, it doesn't even exist anymore. So you have to learn the new language. Alvin Toffler, who wrote the book Future Shock, I don't know if you remember that book, said something really great recently. He said that those that are going to be literate in the 21st century will not be those who can read or write. Those who are going to be literate in the 21st century will be those who can learn, unlearn, and relearn. Those are the people. You understand that? So otherwise, we go on our starting point, but our starting point may have been learned 25 years ago, 20 years ago. So leaders of today have to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Not change your character. Develop in your character. And the more mature you grow, the more flexible you are about other languages that people speak. So you don't change Jesus, you just change your approach or your language to get people to Jesus, because obviously they're not understanding. If you went out there and spoke Hindi or Farsi, people go, what are you talking about? You have to learn the language of the people. But if you're in India, you would speak that. So you have to find out the language. So this is where your maturity increases. And I say to people, by the way, in church, grow in character. Because when you grow in character, you'll relearn everything you've ever learned, but you'll now learn it at a far deeper level. What you learned when you were 20, you learn. But now when you grow in character, learn the same thing, it's far deeper, far more meaningful. The grace of God, what redemption is, serving in church. It's like, whoa. See, some of you here are older, and uh, not me, but uh, you're older, and you're learning stuff that you may have heard before, but it's like now, it's like, whoo, that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because I'm such a good teacher? No, because your maturity has increased and you've heard this stuff before, but now it's like it's starting to click. What changed? Maturity. So those who are literate in the 21st century are those who learn, unlearn, or relearn. The biggest thing here, you said it, is teach these people to invite. If 90% of the people just invite, and then Gary and his staff give them resources and ways, for example, an outreach. You have the DCAT coming. You have um, a picnic. You have you know, all kinds of different things coming up. You have a family day. You have a youth thing. You have dance uh, classes. So these are things people can invite to. This is, sounds funny. <laughs> right? Because dance isn't going to save them. But it may give them friends that will tell them about Christ because they're going to say, ah, goodwill, good works, opens your heart to the good news. Whereas tracks start with good news. They have not seen you help them, understand them, empathize with them. It's just a piece of paper with the end. 1% maybe will go with that. 
99%. That's like opposite. Always remember, good works builds goodwill that opens people to the good news. Good works. My daughter loves dance. She comes. She has friends. Goodwill. Mom now comes to this church. Good news. See, That's the evangelism of today. So as Gary and the staff figure out these kinds of things, because we're all fishers of men. This isn't an end in itself, but it's a means. A means. You don't have means. You don't have bait. Bite the hook. Uh, we ain't going to bite the hook. I'm not going to put stinky shrimp on there. It's stupid. It's unspiritual. I don't want shrimp. I just want hook. You won't catch that many unless you snag them. <laughs> and that's what a lot of times evangelists do. They just want to snag people, just grab them. So you want to bait them, but that's good works. Open, it promotes goodwill, opens people to the good news. So you invite. And if they'll invite, normally speaking, one out of four say, yes, I'll come. So what do you do? You invite more people. If you want a big harvest for tomorrow, you got to throw out a lot of seed today. If you want a massive harvest tomorrow, you got to throw out a lot of seed today. Does every seed germinate? No. Nope. Probably one out of four. So what do you teach these people here, Cynthia? Teach them to invite. Work with the staff so that they have something to invite them to so that they can have good works. Oh, that helps my son, my daughter. We needed some tutors. We needed a mentor. It's good works. Oh, I love that church. They help my kids so much. Goodwill. Hey, you have a family day. I'm going to that church. Good news. Now they stick because the whole package is there. So the uh, main thing is understanding the whole process first, unlearning some things, relearning. When I went to Bible college, they had us go. I took an evangelist, evangelism class or a whole year of that evangelism. They had us do different ways of evangelism and one was the four spiritual laws we have to go to every door knock and give them four. i hated that so when they had us go out i went to the coffee store and i just sat and had coffee and uh, listened to music and because i just i didn't want to do that I said, i'm not going to do that i want to be at home and somebody knock on the door and give me this pamphlet and hook me in snag me by the tail and pull me in the church so i said no i'm not going to do it it was very uncomfortable so i got uh C, that's the worst grade. I, I did pretty good in school, but I got a C plus in evangelism. <laughs> yeah, that to me is like an F, you know. And so I got a C plus, and I was so upset, but I just didn't like the class. But I go to Honolulu and to Hilo. Uh, I think the last total is uh, just, uh, just over 200,000 have received Christ in the last 30 years. Now, uh, do I evangelize? Oh, I'm an evangelism crazy man. I go after souls. Tons are come to Christ. Lives change. But I, I couldn't do it that way. But I still, thank you, but I still evangelize like crazy. So if someone says, you have to do it this way, forget it. Does that mean I'm not an evangelist? No, it's just your approach to me is you should be here because I am here. I ain't, but I have a heart for souls. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. And actually, I'm, I feel like how you feel. I'm, I'm really uncomfortable doing it, mm -hmm. but I do it anyway. Yeah, and you can if that's your faith, but somebody else is like, it's not in my faith. Yeah. I can do it a lot better. That's just a waste of pamphlets. I can take your amount of time and zero it in on something else, and we get hundredfold return. So that's where the learning, unlearning, and relearning comes in. So just take a look at the fruit. If it's tons of fruit, keep doing it. You know, and I'd go, you are to pass out tracks. But if it's not that much fruit, I say, keep the same goal. Ah, absolutely. Okay, good. All right. It's 11. You want to take one more question? One more question. Yeah, if you have one. 
Yes. Um, and then they what felt, do you say what, was what do you first? tell somebody who's been a believer since they were little and they felt called to go into ministry so they started attending classes um, and then what they learned actually caused them to doubt the Bible mm -hmm. and so now they're in this place where they they're struggling with unbelief yeah yeah that happens um, more often than you think. Uh, I had someone do that. They were doing really, really well. And then he took a seminary class and uh, he came back like, you know, I don't think of like this anymore. I think it's like changed into another person, man. But here's the thing. Uh, when someone grows up in the faith, they kind of accept Christ and faith because they accept me and my trustworthiness in their life that I would never give them something that they would it wouldn't be right you know so they basically are saved but they kind of grandfathered in you see God has no stepchildren or he has no grandchildren he only has children and sometimes there are grandchildren, because I came to Christ, because my dad lived the gospel, spoke the gospel. I trust my dad. I'm a Christian. Well, one day he's going to face something that's not his dad. So you're going to hit a seminary professor that just wants to be cool and likes to talk about things that are weird and accept everything, and somebody that dropped his faith down to here and then wrote a thesis on it. And it sounds so academic, but it is so stupid. <laughs> but you can't tell them that because their ego is way up above. Academicians, it's a culture in its own. I know a lot of people that have PhDs. I wouldn't hire them for nothing. They can't preach their way out of a paper bag. And my son, when he went to Bible college, came back home and he said, Dad, I was taught church planting by a teacher that never church planted. <laughs> I taught evangelism by someone who wasn't an evangelist. So now we understand why we graduate weird Christians. <laughs> and that's what's happening here. So here is the thing you have to understand is that that child has to come to grips with his or her own faith. His name was Jonathan Miyashiro. He was in uh, Hilo, grew up in the church, wonderful young man. Out the middle of his senior year, he started to rebel. And one day his mom told me she came home and outside of Jonathan's door was his Bible and a cross necklace and was out in the hallway. And he said to his mom, I don't want these anymore. Oh, she went crazy. She was, she didn't know whether to, you know, go to confession or take drugs. It was just like, I don't know what to do. And uh, so I said, it's okay. Give Jonathan space because he is now coming to grips with his own faith, right? It has to become his faith, not mom's faith. I don't want dad's faith anymore. And that'll only happen when his faith is challenged. Now he's going to be in a stage of ambivalence. Now, do you give up on him? No. You say... Tell me, what's causing you problems? Yeah, and he'll say, well, you know, if God loved people, why does he kill them? Well, and then I say, well, first of all, you know, in Psalm 35, it says, God is God, and first of all, he can do whatever he wants to. So we don't tell God what he should do and what he shouldn't do based on man's laws, because God's laws are far, far higher. And if God sees that it's better for this lady or this man to go home now, then he can kill me. We call it kill. He just says, I'm taking you home. You know, so it's like if a Christian, and he says that in 1 Corinthians 11, some of you take communion and you haven't judged yourself rightly, and for this reason some of you are sick and some even sleep. So it's like my kids, if they're out there playing and they're fighting, I say, hey, quit fighting. I go out there five minutes later, they're fighting. I said, stop fighting or you're going to get in the house. 
They go, I go five minutes later, they're fighting again. I said, stop fighting, you're getting in this house. I go out five minutes later, they're still fighting. That's it, get in the house. <laughs> it's like God saying, I told you to stop this. You're going after that other lady, knock it off. You're, going, you're slanderous, you're, you, you're cheating, you're, you're gossiping, you're doing this. You do that, you get in the house. They keep doing it. God gets pretty upset. He goes, that's it, get home. God loves you that much. God loves you that much. Because to have left you there, you would have cancered, metastasized all of this junk all over the body of Christ. He loves you enough to say, if I left it that way, your future would be horrible. And you would actually drop out of faith. So I love you so much. Get home. Now you're with him forever and you don't bother anybody else. <laughs> can get God do that? He can do whatever he wants to. Because one day, again, you're going to see the videotape. If he would have left you there, or your son who died maybe prematurely, in your mind prematurely. You have to always remember, by the way, Jesus died at 33. That was God's will. 33. So when we say, why did God take so-and-so so young? You don't understand God so much deeper than he. See, what God does is he takes a look at your life, chronology of your life, and he says, should I take you home here or here or here? Where, when's the most optimum time? And if he sees that this is most optimum at 33 and a half, guess what he's going to do? Because of love, he takes you home. And guess what happens to the world? It gets better. If someone says, no, you're doing good, you're like Enoch, I'm going to let you walk with me all the way to the end and I'll take you home. Great. But we don't tell God. What if someone is going pretty bad and they're doing really good like this and then God takes them home here at 40 and you say, why? God is the height of his career. It was, but what you don't know is in heaven he's going to show you the video and this is what's going to happen here. So you want to wait until he destroys everything and his family and kids and life? Or do you, would you rather God take him home here? Because one day when you see the video, you're going to cry and you're going to say, thank you for loving my husband that much. Because now you have forever. See? So remember, you've got to get this in your mind. Everything that God does, everything, everything, is because he loves you and me. So if this child is going through this, stay with them. Ask them, what's the struggle? What are you struggling with? If you don't have the answers, write it down and then say, Gary, here's a list of questions. I'll buy your lunch with my son. <laughs> or Greg, would you answer these questions? And I'll buy your lunch and I'll put you together because he's got questions. Whatever, you know. But you be the initiator, the spark plug, and help him to work through that. But let him wrestle with it. It's because he's going to wrestle with it sooner or later. Yeah. Sexual things, faith things, all kinds of things. My daughter, Abby, uh, we adopted her. When she was a s first year in college, she went gunny bags. And I raised her in the church, pastor's kid. She gets kicked out of a Christian college, goes and moves in with somebody. What do you think it did to our hearts? Her mother's heart was broken. So was mine. Oh, man. So what was she doing? She was finding her own faith. She grew up with daddy's faith, mom's faith. But now she sees a guy that says, you don't need faith to be happy. She jumps in with that, experiments with it. You know what my wife did? It was so cool. My wife, uh, actually, she moved in with a guy in Michigan because she was looking for her real dad, which broke our hearts like, what are we, chopped liver? You know. So well, I want to find my real dad. Well, she goes to Michigan, moves in with a boy, kills us. And here's my wife. My Because of the daily devotions that we do, the Life Journal, my wife emails her journal entry every day to my daughter, Abby, for almost two years. Here's mom's devotion. She never answered one. Just I don't even know if she even read them, but... Uh, two years now goes by. She finds her real dad. He doesn't want to have anything to do with her. Don't ever call me. You don't even exist. 
Well, that was a setback. But it was God helping her to come to grips with her faith and who loved her. Two years we have to suffer with this, though. It's like, why doesn't God do things faster sometimes? Don't you think? <laughs> now, come on. Two years. After all of that happened, one day Anna gets an email. Mom. She said, here's my devotions. Abby sends my wife her devotions. She reads it, and it says, even though God did not have me born of this family, just like the adoption in Christ, I was by God born into the Cordero family. And to me, that's better yet. I'm coming home. Huge. So what takes place after two years, she comes home. What did she do? She found her own faith. Was that easy? It was terrible. Terrible hard. But we had to stay with it. Until this day, Abby and Anna are really close. Partly because I kind of abandoned her. Not you stupid kid. Good for you. You have trouble. Her mother kept loving on her and sending her the emails and devotions. One day it took. She said, I'm coming home. Now she's married to a wonderful Christian man, has two of our grandkids. Anna's up there all the time visiting her. They, they live close to each other. Um, I mean, uh, in Oregon, they live close to our farm. So Anna goes up there and spends time with Abby. But it took two years. In the midst of the two years, did I have doubts? Ooh, was I mad at God? Yes. Was I mad at her? Totally. But stay with it and let them find their faith. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me come. Love you. Thanks, Pastor Wayne. I think it's, that's a great note to end on. There's always hope, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And that's what this new series is about that Pastor Wayne's kicking off today. It's called A New Hope. And so uh, he's going to be talking today about A New Hope for a Stressed Out Life. And when I asked him about that title, it's, he said he wanted that one because he said he's the poster, poster child of stress. So, so we're looking forward to hearing that. Again, be sure to get here early. Um, welcome, everyone. And then... We want to connect people into friends. This weekend, you're going to hear about uh, the salsa ministry. That's our bait, if we want to call it that. We want to get people into salsa, not because we want people to learn how to dance. No, it's because we want people to know Jesus. And a lot of people have signed up for that. But that's just kind of things that we're doing. So we're excited about that. A couple things. One, at 1130, we're going to have our final move. We've got a few things at the office that we want to move back here or here to our new place. So if you can help give us a hand with that. Uh, see Pastor Dave, we would appreciate that. And then, w are you going to be around for just a few minutes? I, f I know folks who want to, you might want to uh, get Pastor Wayne to sign a book. The books are available out in the lobby. If uh, you want to get it, maybe if you want to get him to sign or something, now is a good time to do it. If you want to take a picture with him or you want to take a picture with me, I'm available. <laughs> I'm available too. No, I'm just kidding. So do that, do that before you, um, before you get out of here. And it, it might be, the line might be a little longer tonight. Or even tomorrow, okay? Again, so express your appreciation. We are so blessed, aren't we? We are so blessed to, um, to be part of the New Hope family. And by the way, you want a, a good Christian college to send your son or daughter to? New Hope Christian College in, in, in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, think about that. I, in fact, I, I'd like to, a whole bunch of us, take a trip up there sometime and have the kids go up there because uh, you want them to have a solid education and, and solid Bible teaching, that's the place. In fact, we, we've been talking about one of these days real soon getting some extension classes going here, right here on our campus, and, that, and that'll be exciting as well. All right, so let's close our time in prayer, and then we'll get out of here. Father, what an awesome morning this has been, and we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you're doing here and for, for using Pastor Wayne. Well, Father, we just thank you so much for him and for the love that he has for you and, and the love that he has for us. And Father, we're just so blessed that he would come share a weekend with us away from his family, away from Anna. And we just ask for your, your blessings to be with him in a very special way. Use him in a great and mighty way today and tomorrow just to speak to, to hundreds of people. And Father, thank you for, for that great note we ended on today, that we always have hope that even when our children aren't where we want them to be, um, 
there's hope, God. And we just want to lift our children up to you because, again, if we fail in that area, then we, we, we have truly failed. Father, thank you again for your love for us. Bless the rest of this day. We, can, we, we can't wait to see all the things that you're going to do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone.